Now I'm going to take a look at your mouth. The oral cavity examination begins with evaluation of the patient's lips and teeth. Okay. So we look at the lips and the outer part, the inner mucosal surfaces. The lips are comprised of mucosa and external skin divided by the vermilion border. Common lesions on the lips include squamous cell and basal cell carcinomas, as well as angular colitis seen in patients who are elderly, have thrush, wear dentures, or are diabetic. Examine the teeth for status. If the patient wears dentures, they should be removed to allow complete evaluation of the oral cavity specifically to evaluate the mucosa and the alveolar ridge, which is often atrophied in patients who have dentures. The mucosa is normally pink and moist. The buccal mucosa is examined and is pink. When one looks carefully, one can see the opening of the parotid or Stenson's duct at the level of the upper second molar. Common normal variants in the buccal mucosa include a white bite line and yellow areas known as Fordyce spots. A common abnormality in the buccal mucosa are white plaque-like lesions which often represent leukoplakia. When examining the oral cavity and tongue, a gentle touch is required. It is important to insert the tongue blade slowly and avoid touching the base of the tongue. In children, often a tongue blade is not needed if you have them breathe through their mouth. Examine the tongue for mobility, symmetry, and the presence or absence of fasciculations. Now open your mouth again and keep breathing through your mouth. Have the patient breathe through the mouth. This makes the tongue drop and will elevate the soft palate making the examination easier compared to when the patient breathes through their nose. Let's check your hard palate, soft palate, check the uvula. The hard and soft palates make up the roof of the mouth. There are often ridges in the hard palate. The soft palate is smooth and moves with respiration or when you have the patient say ah. At the end of the soft palate, in the midline, is the uvula. On occasion, this may be bifid. In children, one may see clefts of the soft or the soft and hard palate. On the hard palate, one may see a bony prominence known as the torus palatini. We'll check your tonsils, we'll ch check the back wall of your pharynx or throat, looks good. Laterally, below the soft palate, sit the palatine tonsils. There is an anterior and posterior pillar that makes up the tonsil fossa. The tonsils are pink, should be symmetric, and are often cryptic. There may be debris in the tonsil, which some patients think is food, but is actually known as a tonsillith. Tonsil size is given by a 1 to 4 scale. Here it is important to pay attention to any tonsillar or oropharyngeal pathology, such as exudates, ulcers, masses, or lesions of any kind. The posterior pharyngeal wall is smooth, but may contain some visible blood vessels or small islands of lymphoid tissue. This is called cobblestoning, a normal variant. The tongue is pink, but has many papilla on its dorsal surface, which may become stained from foods or nicotine. The lateral border of the tongue is smooth and pink. Now lift up your tongue slightly. Let's look at the floor of your mouth. Using the tongue blade, one should gently elevate the tongue to evaluate the anterior floor of the mouth. 
On the undersurface of the tongue, you will often see a thin band of mucosa which extends to the floor of the mouth. This is known as the lingual frenum. In newborns, a tight frenum, also known as ankylglossia, leads to difficulty in breastfeeding, which can be treated by division in the office under topical anesthesia. In the floor of the mouth, going posteriorly on either side of the frenum are two raised areas, the submandibular or Wharton's ducts. A common abnormality seen in the floor of the mouth on the lingual surface of the mandible is a bony prominence known as the torus mandibularis. To complete the examination of the floor of the mouth, take the tongue blade and gently push the tongue away from the mandible first on one side and then the other. In evaluating the oral cavity, one must make sure that there are no ulcerations, masses, or growths that might suggest malignancy. At times, it is appropriate to do a bimanual palpation of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. Now I'm going to feel inside your mouth okay. along the floor of the mouth. Okay. So just lift up your tongue a little bit. Checking for any lesions in the floor of the mouth. Checking the submandibular glands, which I'm palpating by manually. I'm going to check underneath your chin here in the submental space. Okay. Keep breathing through your mouth, and then I'm going to check your tongue anteriorly, and then further posteriorly. Rick, I'm going to examine your neck now. Okay. I just want you to relax, okay. kind of loosen your shoulders. The neck exam may be done from the front or behind the patient. The latter is often preferable to feel the thyroid in patients with a large neck. The exam may be completed in any sequence, but you should develop your own routine. The neck has two major triangles, anterior and posterior. I'm going to check the anterior triangle of your neck, which is bordered by the lower edge of the mandible, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and the midline. And then the posterior triangle, which is bordered by sternocleidomastoid muscle, and trapezius, and the clavicle. There are two anterior triangles, separated in the midline by the central components of the neck, and defined posteriorly by the sternocleidomastoid muscle, also known as the SCM. There are two subtriangles in the anterior neck, the submandibular and submental. The submental is midline, and the submandibular are lateral. The posterior triangle is bordered posteriorly by the trapezius muscle, inferiorly by the clavicle, and anteriorly by the posterior border of the SCM. In palpating the neck, one should feel under the trapezius, feel the floor of the posterior triangle, specifically paying attention to the space underneath the clavicle. Gently place the SCM between your fingers to palpate the muscle, and then palpate the soft tissues of the neck. In addition, palpate the area behind the angle of the jaw. This is the area of the tail of the parotid, which is a common site for tumors of this gland. Then palpate the remainder of the parotid gland. In the midline of the neck, one will palpate the hyoid bone, thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, and thyroid gland. The hyoid bone is most superior and extends laterally to its greater cornu. Below this is the thyroid cartilage. In the midline, at the top aspect, is the thyroid notch. The thyroid cartilage tends to be larger in men than in women. Inferior to this is the cricoid cartilage, and often the tracheal rings may be palpated inferior to this. The thyrohyoid and cricothyroid membranes sit between these structures, respectively. The thyroid gland sits on the sides of the trachea. 
The isthmus of the thyroid sits just inferior to the cricoid cartilage. If you have the patient extend their neck, you may actually see the outline of the thyroid gland under the skin. One may palpate the thyroid gland from in front or behind the patient, as noted before. When you have the patient swallow while you palpate the gland, you can often feel the edge of the gland under your fingers. Nodules of the thyroid gland can often be palpated as well. A thyroid nodule that is palpated is usually at least 1.5 centimeters. Any new nodule should have an ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration to determine whether or not it may be observed or needs to be removed. At times, the gland may be firm, suggesting the possibility of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. In children, it is not uncommon to find lymph nodes in the neck, which usually disappear by the age of 12 or 13. The most frequent masses that are seen or palpated in the neck include lymph nodes, branchial cleft cysts, which are typically along the anterior border of the SCM, and thyroglossal duct cysts. These are usually near the hyoid bone, either immediately superior or inferior and close, usually in the midline, but can be somewhat lateral. The thyroglossal duct cyst does move with protrusion of the tongue. For additional information regarding any of the illnesses we discuss, we invite you to visit the AAO HNS website ENTNet.org.